Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson. Matt, 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 Matthew Dickerson. Tech, 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 tech talk. Tech, 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 tech talk. Sit back and relax. It's time to talk technology. Hello, all technologists in the Larval State. It's time to bust out of your virtual chrysalis and become the technological butterflies that you're destined to be. And who better to coach you out from your digital cocoon than our, our very own master technologist, Matthew Dickerson. How's your week been, Matt? Well, James, today is a pretty exciting day. Let me go back to the 27th of March, 2021. Um, on that day, Park Run was canceled in Dubbo. We went out to Narromine and ran in their Park Run. My daughter often reminds me that she came home as the first female, but Park Run is not a race, I remind her. It is when you come first, she responds. Hmm. I digress. My daughter's running success is not what I want to focus on today. Um, that afternoon, you and I sat down to record our first episode of Tech Talk. We did the same the following week. After we built up a few episodes, we released them to the world on the 5th of May, with a total of six episodes released over the next five days. Since the 10th of May, we have released a new episode every Monday at 9 a.m. without fail. Um, Jump to today, and we are recording our 100th episode. Woo-hoo! with COVID separations, remote sessions, river walk recordings, and even being located in different countries, we have brought the latest tech to our listeners each and every week. We have reached finalist status in the Australian Podcast Awards and regularly feature as the highest-ranked Australian-produced technology podcast on Apple Podcasts. Most importantly, the feedback we receive from our listeners is instructive and highly complimentary. But... After bringing you our 100th episode today, just like a cricketer on reaching a century, we will take guard again and continue on without resting on our laurels. Thank you, James, for your insight, intelligence, humor, and always inquisitive mind. The podcast would not be a success without your invaluable input. Onward and upward with the next 100 episodes. Yippee! Well, thanks, Matt. Um, I appreciate your sentiment. And I love coming up with a different intro for each of those episodes. That is over 900 topics we have covered in that time. Wow. Um, I love the idea of going back and listening to some of those eerie episodes. Whoops. I will put my teeth back in early episodes and seeing what concepts were successful and which ones not so much. But enough reminiscing, as you say, onward and upward. Cool. Oh, sorry, James, I'm a bit busy today. Hopefully my AI friends filled you in on this caught, being our 100th episode. Caught me off guard there. <laughs> it's a bit scary, isn't it? It was, I must admit, a slightly Americanized version of myself and yourself, but it's not too bad, and that's a free tool. I uploaded a minute of my voice and a minute of your voice and then typed in the text from that, and there we go. So we've done a hundred episodes <laughs> in the in the flesh, but maybe the next hundred wow. episodes we can just do in the virtual. No, yeah. we're not. We won't. We won't do that to you, people. Out well, there. everyone fooled. <laughs> we, will, we will keep being here in the flesh, and uh, we sit here and do it face to face, and as much as we possibly can, we'll do that. Only when we're busy with other stuff, we'll do the. No, I won't. I won't even joke about it. <laughs> I think people, that's incredible, though, to hear your own voice. Um, with a different accent. Yeah, and if I paid more for some of the paid services, I could have really removed that Americanism out of it. So that, I wanted to demonstrate what a free account could do, and that's mm. something that, that literally took me a minute. It uploaded that, and then so a couple of minutes to upload some voice samples, and then I simply typed text in and said, generate voice. So I could type in any text and make it sound like that person. Made me sound like I was from California. <laughs> That's right. And uh, <laughs> surf's up, dude. I, I just all of a sudden started generating a whole lot of different memories in my head of days on you know, in San Diego and what uh, I'm making it all up. Now. <laughs> <laughs> but it's, it's quite incredible. Isn't it? Anyway, I'm very proud and happy that we've hit 100 episodes, as you can tell with my AI voice. But it's actually just a, an indication of where things are headed. It's yeah. only been 100 episodes, but. Already we're talking about... And we'll get everyone questioning what's real and what's not real and... Uh, oh, good. <laughs> That's right. And you'll even see that in those couple of samples there, I, I threw some ums and some ahs in... Because that's what people do when they're talking. So if you're trying to make it sound like it's real, and even the pace that varied there slightly, yeah. that, that wasn't me. I wasn't doing the that. The cadence I just, of the speech. And, yeah. yeah. I typed it in and just said, generate 
my voice and away it went. And so it changed the volume, it changed the pitch and the intensity. It got a few things a little bit wrong there and maybe you would have put some more stress on different words than that did, but it still yeah. sounded like someone sitting there having a conversation. It was weird. <laughs> and all of a sudden I started picturing your face as some something completely different to, <laughs> to who you were. Your voice wa- wasn't yours, but it was yours. And yeah. I just, yeah, oh, just played with my head. Yeah, yeah, it's pretty freaky. <laughs> now... Don't do this at home, folks. Don't pretend to be someone and put words in someone else's mouth. That's not what it's designed for. I'm not sure what it's designed for, actually, <laughs> oh, no. because that I sounds like what you'd want to do. For evil. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> a phone call or publishing something on the net and said, look what this friend of mine said about someone else. You could cause all sorts of trouble, yeah. but don't do that, okay? Yeah. Just use it to play with and have fun with. You do have to click on something when you first go into the account to say that I have permission to generate this person's voice, they gave me permission. So I, I didn't actually ask you for that beforehand, James. Sorry, but I just thought <laughs> no, no, no. it'd be nice to hear your voice as part of the initial podcast. So yeah. it is wow. really scary, but also absolutely amazing. Yes, absolutely amazing. Uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, I'm dumbfounded. Let's get on with the show, though. Enough dilly dallying. We'll get our rolling into our first story. Now, make hay while the sun shines, folks. But we all know that the winter is coming, and the question is, are you ready for it? What sort of heating system do you have at your place? Now, my favourite sort of heating is the stuff piped through your floor. That toasty warmth that starts at your toes and soaks through your feet all the way up to your face. But if you can't have in-floor heating, there's got to be a new product that just might warm your cockles all the same. And it's heated wallpaper, ladies and gents. Matt, what are your thoughts about this newfangled infrared wallpaper? We talk about some crazy concepts, don't we? This is amazing. Where did you come up with this one from, James? Infrared wallpaper? Seriously? It's a radiator any day, I'm sure. Now, do you like the in-floor heating that's the slab heating, or do you like the in-floor heating where it's got ducting underneath? I've got the vents. Right, so you prefer the vents over the No, 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 no. It's the slab heating. Yeah, Yeah, wherever you step, that floor feels nice and toasty warm. There's no such thing as cold tiles. No, that's right. I'm with you. So that's what we've got here in this house is slab heating, and I'm I'm with you. That's why I'm going to be hanging out at your place (laughs) a whole lot more than... (laughs) James, you've got a home to go to? No, I'm just hanging around for the night. (laughs) In my bare feet. But what I do like about slab heating is that it feels like it's actually quite healthy. When you've got air blowing from somewhere. It's obviously picking up from somewhere and blowing it in there. Mm. And so you wonder about where that air is being brought from and how it's circulating that air around. And then you've got a hot spot in the room where the air is coming in, for example, on that duct where it's blowing in through. And with a radiator, whether it be a a bar heater or a a gas heater, whatever it might be, you've got one spot that's hot Mm. and then the rest of the room that obviously has a gradation of heatness or hotness Mm. as it goes across the room. And obviously that's all, we're talking about convection heating there, where you're heating up the air near that radiator and then it slowly heats up the air next to it and next to it, but you stand Mm. on the other side of the room and it's obviously not as hot. Yeah, the big temperature differential across the room. That's right. The other risk is, and this is me putting my hand up to, to show what a bad parent I am, our son, who grew up in our house with slab heating, didn't know what a bar heater looked like. And we were visiting a friend one day, and our son was crawling around on the ground, as he did at the age oh. that he was, and just saw something glowing red. and thought, that'd be a nice thing to put my hand on to yeah, lift myself up. Much. And he put his hand around one, and next thing you know, we heard a scream come from the other side of the room, and oh, wow. up to the hospital, and he's still got the scars today as an yeah, adult wow. from that little gripping hold of that. So that's me showing what a bad parent I am, but also the fact that those bar heaters can be dangerous. So infrared wallpaper doesn't rely on convection, it relies on radiation. And radiation heating heats up objects. Luckily, Mm. we just happen to be objects, so it heats up us as we walk around. Now, one of the things that's interesting about this is that I did a little bit of research and tried to find out exactly how much it would cost you to heat your home, for example, with convection heating, whether it be a bar heater or some other type of heating of the air versus radiation, And it seemed to be that the pricing wasn't dramatically different. And this was based out of a story from the UK, and electricity prices are quite high in the UK. So it seemed like if you had gas coming into your home, it was probably about the same price as this type of heating, except when you heat up the air in a room, it's very hard to contain it to one room. So you close the door on the lounge room because you want to sit down in the movie in the lounge room and watch a movie, but it's got a gap under the door, and so Mm. some of that heat leaks out, so you have to keep pumping heat in. One of the great things about wallpaper heating is you just turn on the room that you're in and it heats up, as I said before, the objects in the room. Yeah, right. So it actually can be cheaper for you because you're not trying to heat up 
lots of bits of the house by default with the air circulating through the whole house. So that seemed pretty good. Installation-wise, it wasn't too bad either. And I got some examples of a three-bedroom home out of the UK. And if you were to put in a normal heat pump, which seems like what most people are doing at the moment is going for heat pumps, that's about 8,000 pounds to do a three-bedroom home with a heat pump. To do infrared wallpaper would cost you about 4,000 pounds. So right. a bit cheaper to install, theoretically a bit cheaper to run. Just make sure your kids don't go and, I don't know, get a knife and scratch the wallpaper off. Hopefully they don't do that. That's not going to be a good thing. And it doesn't seem like you've got to go and install some big three-phase power system. It seems like it's not too bad in terms of the power that it needs to run overall. Sorry, now your reference to pounds here, is it only is it only available in the UK at this stage? There are companies at the moment in the UK who are actually out there installing it. They've done some trials. They're doing some trials in some social housing and some housing groups in the UK and Wales in particular. So that's the only place I could find that this infrared wallpaper is available at this mm. stage. And there might be some other companies around the world. But if you're going to test out a heating system, you know, you want the to UK. a cold country, <laughs> somewhere cold and miserable. That's right. So <laughs> the UK seemed to tick the box for both of those requirements. So at the moment, yes, only available there. But surely if this is successful and it seems to work well, That'll start to go mm. across the rest of the world pretty quickly. Good ideas seem to propagate quite quickly. But again, the thing I like about it is it's not very well, it's unobtrusive. It's not sticking out. It's not sitting in the corner. It's not blowing some air somewhere. You would just walk into the room and you go, oh, gee, it feels quite nice in here, James. I, I don't need to go up to Matthew's house and stand around the same bed. <laughs> I, I could just stay in this room here. And well, you now, could, but you've still got to decide whether you're, the, whether you're going to go with the uh, floral print or the uh, stripes or whatever. <laughs> or the ones the, that... The, 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 the 70s blobs. Uh, yeah. Well, I used to like the ones that my, my dad was a builder and he used to do a lot of work for Chinese restaurants. And the ones that had the fur, the ones that were lifted about oh, a millimetre or so off, so yeah, it's right. kind of like a fur that you'd rub like your hand Like a velour over. type, yeah. yeah mm. something like that. So I remember <laughs> that sort of wallpaper being in, and as a kid I'd go along and help Dad. I don't know if I actually helped or hindered, but used to go along with Dad while he was doing building work, and I'd always like just rubbing my hand on that lovely soft <laughs> feel of wallpaper. It was too good to be wallpaper. It was too nice. So it's, uh, it's certainly... One of the big decisions about the pattern on there, but I just love the idea that it actually is built in. And from a retrofitting perspective, not too bad. There's some things like slab heating. It's quite difficult to go and retrofit your home with slab heating, but to retrofit your home with wallpaper, that's not too bad. You can go and put some wallpaper Mm. up pretty easily. So not a bad concept. Let's see how that goes. Now, here's another story from the Biomedical Files. We all hopefully acknowledge that thirstiness is not the best indicator of dehydration. And during a heavy workout, dehydration can come on fast. If you're like me, you're probably going to forget to take a drink until you really need it. And you probably forgot to bring your water bottle anyway. Matt, I need some sort of personal assistant to remind me to look after myself. Got any suggestions? I was thinking of you when I looked at this story. Were you? Right, okay. I thought elite athletes, this is exactly (laughs) exactly what they need. (laughs) Because you're right, you can impact your performance very quickly with only a small amount of dehydration. And as you said, being thirsty is not a good indicator of dehydration. By the time you're thirsty, you're already dehydrated. Mm, and I've, I've read various stats that talk about 1% or 2% dehydration levels can be enough to affect your performance by 10% or more. So it yeah, is right. really important. Having an idea of how much you've sweated, how much moisture, how much liquid you've lost from your body, and the electrolyte values associated with that. So you know whether you need to replace it with just straight water or whether you need to have some other substance, some electrolytes, some salt tablets, whatever it might be, depending on how extreme that sweat might be, is a really good idea. And there's a few ones out there that have been okay-ish, but this one so far, it's by a company called Nix, seems to be the best one I've found so far. The first thing you do is you've got a pod and you put some patches or you put a patch inside the pod. And then they recommend you stick that on your bicep because I didn't know this, but that's the place that's the best place to detect sweat. So now, your guns shoot out the sweat apparently, like that's nothing right. else. Yeah, that's right. Gotcha. That, that's your guns. I'm not sure about <laughs> my guns in inverted commas there. But there's places you might think you might sweat more, like under the arms, for example. Yeah. But obviously it's not that convenient to go and stick a centre up under your arms because it would probably rub and be yeah, inconvenient. I don't want to rip off any chest hairs either if I <laughs> stick them on my chest right. or anything like that. So the bicep, so you stick it on the bicep, it's got a patch inside 
inside it. And that then, obviously via Bluetooth, it's got to have Bluetooth, of course, that then sends a signal to your phone. So you can get alerts on your phone or, of course, on your watch, whether you've got a, a Garmin watch or an Apple watch, you can get alerts on there to say that you've lost a certain amount of liquid. It would then obviously extrapolate takes a certain amount of liquid from your bicep and then says across the body, that means you've already lost half a litre or mm. 100 mils. And then the idea is it gives you regular reminders. You've lost 100 mils, go and drink 100 mils. And that's the secret is drinking small amounts regularly rather than, all oh, right, I'll wait till I've lost a litre and then I'll go on <laughs> down a litre and that should be fine. <laughs> yeah. right. And then again, as I said, but the that's whole what concept. I do. <laughs> <laughs> well, there you go. Uh, there's a condition, and I've actually had this condition known as hyponatremia, where you, I actually was in a desert, a mountain bike ride across the Simpson Desert. Crazy concept, stupid idea, almost died on it because I actually got hyponatremia because I did that. I was going along and I'd go, right, I'll ride for a while and then I'll have a huge big gulp of water because I know I've got to drink heaps of water. Yeah. But I overdid it and it actually gets to the stage where the dilution of water in your bloodstream or, or the dilution of electrolytes is not enough to actually take nutrients to different parts of your body. Yeah, so right. I was thinking there were stomach cramps and I'm laying down the ground looking at vultures circling overhead and <laughs> thinking, that's it, I'm done for. I, I must have drunk enough water. I better drink more water. And of course, that exacerbates the problem. Yeah, so there wow. is that condition known as hyponatremia. If I had have had one of these Nix hydration biosensors on, I would have gone, huh, I know what the problem is. I just seem to have lost a certain amount of liquid and I was actually not... I was, I was losing electrolytes because I was out in the desert sweating a lot. Yeah. So I wasn't really aware of how much I was losing in electrolytes, but I would be able to see exactly how much in this particular scenario. Lots of sips regularly. And that's that was the, what I learned after that first day. The doctor on the particular ride, after they picked me up and did stuff to me, they said, right, get out there and ride again the second day. I mean, you're sure about this? Yeah. <laughs> and just take some liquid on a more regular basis and, yeah, be sensible. But the only thing that I probably thought was a bit of a downer on this one was that You've got to have the little patches that go inside the unit itself are a once-only patch. Oh. And they're a bit rich. You pay 25 bucks for four of them. So six bucks a patch, you've got to be a bit serious about that run. If you're just going to go, I'm just going for a couple of kilometers, oh, do I want to buy $6 on a couple of kilometer run? Mm. Yeah, probably not. I'll wait till I'm doing a longer run or a longer bike ride where I'm going to be. Something a bit more serious. Yeah, Unless, right. of course, you've got sponsorship. Well, that's right. <laughs> You're talking about yourself now. <laughs> so, I'm just laughing about how funny it is that I should get sponsorship to go on my little runs. Yeah, anyway. Right. So <laughs> I like the fact that we just keep coming up with different ways of monitoring our health. There are more and more devices. Yeah. We seem to talk about it just about every week. There are different health devices out there and different ideas. Well, this is a great idea, but as you say, it comes with a handicap. Of, it gets a bit expensive every yeah. four, four bit, um, joints of exercise. <laughs> um, it costs you 25 bucks. Yeah. So um, there's bound to be someone to come up with, oh, well, we've got a cheaper option. That's right. Or reusable option. Re- would be, reusable. Would be yeah, it would be even better, yeah. Yeah, that's right. But anyway, you might just do it on a weekly longer run or just – testing out on some runs to see how much liquid you need and then remember it for the other run. So you could use it in that way. But yeah. Or if you want to spend $6 every time you go to the, for a run, people spend more than that when they go to the gym. So Do what it. the heck? Yeah. yeah. Now here's another story to help chase the paranoid among us back under the bed covers. Lock the doors and draw the blinds, folks. The 21st century is out to get us. Now, have you heard of cloned car number plates? It's not a new thing, but it was much harder for the bad guys to pull off in a world without 3D printers. Of course, now in 2023, where 3D printers are a dime a dozen, printing someone else's number plate is just a minor challenge. Matt, tell me gently, which jewellery store heist am I about to be pinned for as the getaway car? (laughs) Well, it's somewhat ironic that number plates used to be made in prisons. So They're not anymore, <laughs> but for a long time that was one of the good jobs yeah. that the prisoners had. And so you can imagine them going, oh, hold on, if I just whack up a couple of extra spares of this yeah, one, that's right. that should be right. But thieves have gotten a little bit more sophisticated than that. They're actually looking out there for a particular car that they're going to steal. Then they go and find another car that's the same car, a red Model Y Tesla hmm. Oh, I can see those number plates out there. I'll just go and 3D print those same number plates. And as you will remember, we don't have registration stickers on our cars anymore. The old mm. days of, in fact, the old, old days, you used to have to soak it in water and then just slide yeah. it onto the windscreen and <laughs> yep. then we went to stickers and that all kind of moved forward. But now we don't have that. And the police, and this is New South Wales in particular, 
The police have got some sophisticated cameras. As they drive around, they'll see a number plate scan as they drive past, and they can scan those very quickly. And it comes up and says, yes, that's the right colour car, the right model car, and the number plate's there, and everything's okay. No outstanding speeding fines. The car's registered. Everything's okay. But it doesn't guarantee that it's on the correct car. And that's exactly what thieves are doing. They're taking a number plate off a similar car, one that won't be picked up by the police if they see that number plate and car combination, but that car can then go and do whatever it wants. Speeding fines, who cares? It's going to be sent to the real owner of that car. Use it in a ram raid. They're going to go and knock on someone's door and say, sorry, sir, you've just uh, been involved in a ram raid. Well, I was actually sitting here watching a movie. Um, Sorry, here's the CCTV. Look at that. That's your car with your number plate. And the person's going, oh, it looks like you're right. Take me in, sir. (laughs) (laughs) And that's what's been happening. People have had knocks on the door. And one particular woman had $5,000 in speeding fines. (gasps) And again, how do you prove it wasn't you? (laughs) Show me the picture. Oh, well. Well, yeah, I know that's my car and my number plate, but but it it wasn't me. Sure thing, madam. (laughs) Everyone Uh says that, so that's a bit of a problem. Queensland have actually taken a slightly different approach to this where they're actually printing little 10-cent piece-sized Queensland logos on the number plate that can only be seen at certain angles. Now, it just means it's a bit harder for someone to clone that number plate. Mm. Use your 3D printer, print a number plate. Oh, but those little hologram type devices, they're a bit harder to actually print on there. And they're probably relying on the fact that it's too late once people go and say, let's have a look at that number plate from a different angle. But again, if someone else can produce it, obviously if the Queensland government can produce it, then someone else can produce it at some stage. So what next? How do we go next? I mean, you're not going to check. If you see a number plate in a car that looks right, you're not going to pull a car driver over and say, let me check the VIN on your car Mm. against your rego to make sure it all matches up. So I I don't know what the solution is. In fact, the authorities have said exactly that. Um, We don't know what to do about it. Just uh, don't put photos (laughs) online of your car. Don't put photos online of your car. (laughs) And and that's good advice, but there's nothing stopping people just driving around the streets. I know we're going to steal a certain car for some jobs we're going to do. I just go and drive the streets until I find that same car. Oh, there's a number plate because you've got to display the number plates. You Mm. can't hide your number plate because then you're in breach of the law to do that, and then obviously you might be trying to avoid speeding fines yourself. So it's a tricky one, isn't it? It's a terrible one. Yeah, so <laughs> keep in mind, just, keep in mind that that if you see someone knocking your door, or some, the police are knocking your door because of that, just I mean, normally I'd go to my kids and say, "Okay, who had the car out that night?" Mm. But in this case, the kids, when they claim innocence, might actually be totally innocent. It's a it's a tricky one. But three D printers, that's. The, the thing now, we can print so many things so and easily. All we've got uh, to help you out, folks, is a shrug of the shoulders. <laughs> that's, <laughs> You're that's on your own. It. Yep, that's it. Now, I'll confess to you listeners that I can be a bit clumsy in typing on a touch screen. There's something about the feel of an actual button that I swear enhances my experience with messaging. I don't know about you. What can I say? I just like buttons. And I'm guessing that I'm not the only one judging by the need for this next piece of technological wizardry. Virtual buttons created as an ultrasound illusion. Matt, I like the idea of this. This sounds awesome. On a flat screen, it feels like buttons. Yeah. Now, you'll remember that Apple were the first ones that came up with their haptic touch. So they did a little thing where when you press certain buttons in a certain way, and it was normally the home button because they found that Getting the home button, this is back before the screen took over the entire front of the the phone, the home button, getting that to be waterproofed around the edge of that was particularly tricky. Mm. So Apple's solution was, well, let's not make it a button. Let's just make it an area that you press on. But it felt a bit discombobulating to actually press but not have anything go in. Mm. So they put a vibration in. So when you pressed on that... The phone vibrated. And that's called haptic button. Haptic touch. Yeah, yeah. haptic touch. Right, okay. So, I didn't, I've learned something new. There we go. So that was cool. But again, we're now talking about going forward because let's face it, you don't have a home button on a modern phone now, a modern smartphone. You have all glass. And there's other things that you might have as all glass as well. You might turn up to a office, a government office block, and you need to choose on the menu which person you want to see or whatever it might be, and you've got buttons on a screen to touch. But... Did I press that button? Mm. Nothing's happened. Not, mm. I'm waiting now. Maybe I didn't press it. Do I press it harder? What happens? And that's exactly what you said. The problem that people have, 
they want to feel a button pressing. They want to hear a click. Yeah. They want to know that they've actually pressed that button. On a mouse, you've got a bit of a click noise when you click on something on screen. So that's exactly where researchers, and this is over in the Netherlands, they've got this research where they've actually been putting an ultrasonic wave across the actual glass so your finger actually reacts to that ultrasonic wave. The reason we know that we've touched something is that when we press our finger on something, and I'm doing it here now, which is of no use to <laughs> listeners whatsoever. I can see folks, I'll vouch for it. <laughs> That's good. When you press on that, it actually stretches your finger. So there's nerve endings in your finger, obviously. I remember a friend of mine from uni, one of his experiments that he had to do as part of his uh, medical course, or it wasn't, he wasn't doing medicine, but the, the medical related course he's doing, was to actually get needles. He, he wasn't getting lots of people lining up to volunteer, but he'd get fine point needles and move them further and further apart until you could pick up that there were two needles to demonstrate that there were more nerve endings in certain parts of the body. Mm. So fascinating wow. little experiment. Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. So that's what happened in our fingertips. When we press on it, it stretches our finger and we've got enough nerve endings there that we go, oh, I'm detecting pressure there. It's stretched out. My finger must be flat. I'm pressing a button. But you can do the same thing with ultrasonic waves because it tricks your finger with those ultrasonic waves that you get. Wow. Typically, what you'd do is you'd have another piece of thin glass that would be added to whatever glass it was that would contain the ultrasonic waves. So it makes it a little bit more, I suppose, bulky on a piece of glass that's in an office block, no big deal. On your smartphone, are we going to get there with smartphones with this? Mm. Probably not yet, but maybe at some point in time because – you want to reduce the amount of bulk you've got with the phone and obviously probably use a bit more power to do that. But I just love the idea that just with class and waves, sound, ultrasonic now waves. fool our brains into thinking that there's a punchable we're, button. We're not that clever, are we? We get fooled by a whole range of things. <laughs> I love it. Now, I'm going to go out on a limb here and suggest that the mercury content in food and water is not something that features prominently on your worry list. But I remember watching a news piece years ago about an Australian woman who was experiencing difficulty in carrying her pregnancies to a full term. And after a study of significant length, they found that she had elevated levels of mercury, mercury in her blood. Now, mercury being a heavy metal takes a lot to excrete from our blood supply, so it accumulates and it does damage in the process. And for people who eat a lot of fish and chips, especially where the fish that they sell you is from an apex predator like a shark, that mercury accumulation may be a legitimate concern. Now, that was the issue for that pregnant lady. But, Matt, there is a new rob robotic hand that can literally point out mercury contamination in food and water now. The World Health Organization actually considers mercury a major public health concern. Wow. Because I'm with you. I thought mercury. Well, there was there was a big case back in uh, I think the fifties or sixties at Minamata in Japan. We actually call mercury poisoning now Minamata disease. Right. Um, but um, yeah, uh, mercury. Who cares? You wouldn't have thought that was a big problem, but we don't know about it. As you say, it's one of those things that accumulates. You might not know about it for twenty years, and then suddenly you say, "Hold on, why didn't anyone tell me about this mm. all this time?" So there are still people working on trying to detect it, and that's obviously the crucial part. If you can detect it in water, out of a tap, or in water in a body of water, or in food, then that's obviously a good thing. The detection process, though, is typically a chemical process, which is not that easy to do, and so people typically don't do it because it's not that big an issue. But this robo hand is actually quite clever. It's got a little uh, tellarium wires on the end, and when they touch mercury, they get the triboelectric effect, which generates some voltage, and then it detects that you've got mercury there, but it can get it down to a few nanomoles of mercury ions in a litre of water. Wow. So we're talking nanomoles, so that's 10 to the minus 9, and mole, what's that, 6.02 by 10 to the 23 yeah, is a mole? Yeah, particles yeah. per mole. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Something like that. It's, it's, it's some crazy definition, isn't it, about how many atoms are in 12 grams yeah. of carbon-12 or something. That's right. They it just seems so obscure. Yeah, we could have a big, long science lesson. <laughs> it's probably going to take about 40 or 50 minutes to take you through the whole lot, so we won't do that. <laughs> That's right. But not much, basically. Yeah. The bottom line is you don't need much mercury for it to detect that you've got mercury in there. So if you've got mercury, as you say, on a piece of fish or in any foods, then this can pick it up. But the researchers aren't satisfied with that. What they're really aiming for is to have this robotic hand that would be cheap enough that a range of food places could have it, and you would literally 
put it on someone and their job would be to do some testing and they would just pick up things. And each of the fingertips would have testing for different things they might want to be picking up. So mercury today, other things that might be picked up in food, put those on different fingers and this person would simply go along and pick up food. Yep, pick up food. Oh, hold on. This one detected mercury or maybe one of the other things that's on one of the other fingers. Mm. So it sounds like a pretty clever way to go about it. And again, I just think that we're getting to the point where we can make the world a better place from a technology perspective if we can get our food and our health better. And Mm. here's a perfect example where we might not think it's much of a problem here in Australia, but there are countries around the world where... Well, I'm guessing, yeah, with the World Health Organisation involved there, that it's probably some third world countries or uh, poorly developed countries where their water and their food supplies may be tainted without people knowing. And that was the other thing I was thinking of, is the water supply. So again, you can have this robotic hand, draw some water up from the well, put your finger in it, yep, everything's okay. You could do that on a range of different wells and suddenly you find that there's a well that's getting some mercury leaking into it from somewhere and okay, don't draw from that well anymore. So it does sound like... Well, I was talking about sharks earlier on too, being apex predators. So a little bit of mercury in the seaweed that gets then eaten by the little fish and the little fish get eaten by the big fish and then the sharks are eating the the big fish and lots of big fish, of course. And so, um, yeah, so it just accumulates in their tissues and if um, you're a fan of flake, um, uh, then, um, yeah, it can be a bit of a hazard for you. Yeah. But isn't it incredible? There's just the things that we come up with. We, in the rural sense here, I did nothing for this, but that we as in humans came up with in terms of being able to detect things like mercury and these problems that we're constantly solving. Yeah, wow. Now, an invisible car, a jet or a boat is the sort of fictitious stuff straight out of a James Bond film. But for technologists and engineers, it represents a pretty cool challenge. And there have been a couple of reasonable efforts at at simulating invisibility in recent years. So don't be surprised when we tell you that now the plans are underway for an invisible super yacht, all 88 metres of it. Matt, is this how the rich show off now, or is it just by not having anything to actually show off? (laughs) Or could this be just a modern-day version of the Emperor's New Clothes? (laughs) Well, I actually go back to 982 Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, one of my favourite series of books there. And, of course, in Life, the Universe and Everything, they landed a spaceship on the Lord's cricket field while they were playing cricket. Mm. And, of course, they're sitting there going, well, why can't it be seen? And they said, oh, we've put a SEP field, SEP field around it, which referred to in the book someone else's problem. And (laughs) and the idea is that it's, you know, someone's natural predisposition, predisposition not to see anything that they don't want to see. So he just put something there that people don't want to see and they'll look the other way. So it sounds like a great idea. They're being a bit cleverer than that, though, with this yacht. They're not putting a someone else's problem field around it. They're using mirrors, and or mirrored glass, actually, to reflect what's around them. And you think, well, how's that going to make it invisible? Now, if it was a car, it's a bit harder because you're reflecting back people and buildings Mm. and Mm. all sorts of different things. a lot more topography to worry about. Yeah, that's right. But on the ocean, if you look out across the ocean, you see ocean until you see sky. Mm. So there's not a lot of variety in what you see. Put a mirror out there somewhere and get the angles right on that and you look out across there and you'll see ocean and there's just a bit of a funny little haze there maybe. It looks a little bit different. But anyway, I see ocean and then a bit of sky because it's reflecting the ocean and the sky there. So I think you're right. I think it is a way for people to show off how rich they are. Look at my yacht. You can't see it. Uh-huh. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just thinking about the trouble when when uh, a cyclone blows into the bay and um, the boat breaks its moorings and drifts Where is out. It? Where is it? Sets adrift. <laughs> what, what do you do then? <laughs> so it sounds... you're right for being so rich. <laughs> that's right. It sounds quite clever using mirrored glass. It's actually run by hydrogen and solar energy from some secret solar wings that it has that fold out there. And in the pictures I saw of it, it's actually got quite large sides and obviously they're the mirrored sides there because all the other things inside the boat, they would be normal-ish. And so you can't see those because you've got these big mirrored sides on, yeah, the, on right. the side to keep everything hidden away. It's I don't know about this part. It talks about it being 3D printed. Now, I don't know if that's a bit like Bluetooth. You just say it's 3D printed to make it sound trendy. <laughs> it's a pretty big 3D printer that's going to print an 88-meter 
yacht. So mm. I'm not sure how much of it's 3D printed, how the components are 3D printed. I don't know 3D printers that print mirrored glass as well. Mm. So it might just be part of the marketing hype to say that it's 3D printed. But the rest of it, the rest of it sounds pretty nice. It sounds like a pretty over-the-top boat. It's got a Zen garden. It's got a, a 15-metre exclusive suite for the owner with a private terrace and floor-to-ceiling glass doors. It all sounds very cool, but the mm. thing that I was most impressed about it was the fact that it's claiming invisibility. And it's not in claiming invisibility like some American planes that claim to be invisible to radar. Yeah. This is claimed to be visible to the naked eye. Okay, gamers, out of all the gaming consoles sold since the beginning of time, which would you rank the highest selling console? The Sony PlayStation 4, perhaps? Hmm? The Nintendo Game Boy or the Nintendo Switch? Now, pause the podcast now, have a debate with your mates, and we'll be back with the answer directly. Okay, welcome back. For those of you who actually paused and had the argument, we hope you're all still friends. Matt is here with the answer, and the losers among you had better get ready to pay up. Matt, which con- console has sold more? Nintendo Game Boy, the Nintendo Switch, or the Sony PlayStation 4? Well, it depends when you ask that question. A few weeks ago, asking that question might have given you a different result because the Nintendo Switch has just moved into third place. It's jumped. It's jumped. It's just hit third place in the best-selling console of all time. It's just surpassed the PlayStation 4 and the Nintendo Game Boy. Ah, so if you voted for either of those two, bad luck, pay up. Now, you might say, well, I was working on last month's information, so you might have a valid point no, there. No, 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 it's currently, current so, information. yeah, 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 so oh, forget yeah. all that. So, current information, then Nintendo Switch in third place, which, of course, then says, well, what's in first and second? That's the important thing. So, it's got a long way to go to catch up. Because the Nintendo Switch, or sorry, if we go to number two, the Nintendo DS is in second place with 154 million units sold. The Sony PlayStation 2, not the 4, the 2, is in first place with 155 million sales. So I remember when the PlayStation 2 came out and it was... White hot, and everyone was just, you've got a what? It's PlayStation 2. Yeah, that's right. That makes you special. No, I still have, my my wife and I still wonder whether getting our son that PlayStation 2 was the right thing, because that was the (laughs) beginning of his journey into games, and maybe maybe he wouldn't be playing games so much now if he hadn't got that game. (laughs) But the Nintendo Switch, the various versions of the Switch, have just hit 122.5 million sales. So a fair way to go to reach the PlayStation 2 or the Nintendo DS, but not too bad. Now, that's all interesting because the Switch's sales have just started to drop off a bit lately. So they're still selling them, but they've dropped off 23% compared to the same quarter a year ago. So Mm. they've started to drop off, but that happened. I mean, how many PlayStations 2 are being sold now? Obviously, not very many, if any at all. So effectively, you're going to always see that. But one of the things that was fascinating in this is that as I went through looking at some of the various gaming consoles and the various things that are being sold, Pokemon cards, 88% increase over the last year in Pokemon cards. That's not Over the last year? Over the last year. That's not a new gaming console. That's good old-fashioned cardboard Pokemon cards, 88% increase. That's like the next generation of kids realising, oh, this looks like a cool game (laughs) from retro times. I'm getting my footy cards out again. (laughs) So interesting, but gaming consoles are still being sold, but I just, I see a lot more now for computers and online gaming where you don't necessarily need the gaming console. Are the graphics good enough in some of those? Well, graphics cards are getting pretty good in computers now. So maybe you won't see this change a lot over the next decade because you've really got to have something. They've got to come up with something new Mm. to really rejuvenate that whole market because so much gaming is now done online. For those of you who, like me, haven't bought a battery yet for your domestic solar storage because you are holding out for a cheaper alternative, this is your cue to lean in closer to the wireless. Because Matt is loaded up with some good news about solar power storage. Matt, hit him with the good juice. It actually seems like one of those examples where some people were way ahead of their time. 
way back in the 1980s, there was an Australian professor that invented the vanadium redox flow battery. Mm. And it didn't go very well. Because back in the 1980s, who needed batteries? Who needed storage of significant amounts of electricity? You had some AA batteries you stuck in some little console maybe, but that was about it. I can remember in the old chemistry syllabus from a couple of years ago, we actually had to talk about those vanadium redox batteries. Yeah, well. I don't know why. It always seemed a bit weird. And I was like, here's something we've got to talk about and I don't know why. maybe it's the future. And that's that's the interesting part here. Because obviously when you talk about storage of electricity, large storage of electricity, you talk about lithium-ion batteries, whether it's in your car or in your home or in power grids where they're trying to keep some stability in the grid. You talk about pumped hydro, that's a good way of storing power. Mm. But the great thing about the VRFBs is that unlike lithium-ion batteries, they don't wear out. So when you've got a lithium-ion battery, you know that it's going to have 100% capacity today. And as you use it, whether it be your mobile phone or your car or your power wall at home, then slowly they degrade over time. And that's a bit annoying and you still get enough use out of it and you don't have to sometimes replace it down the track. But with the VRFBs, you don't have that same thing. Now, the disadvantage is that they're not as energy dense as lithium iron. Now, that's bad for a car, but okay for your house, okay for large energy storage because you don't really care about how large the device is when you're storing power for the grid. When you're Mm. generating too much power in the middle of the day from solar, you need to store it somewhere. You don't care that you've got a big battery. You care when you're driving around. You've got to tow a trailer with a big battery, but you don't care when you're storing that power in that way. So I see VRFB batteries being used for installations at homes, large power sources. In China at the moment, the largest one is installed, 100 megawatts of power, capacity of 400 megawatt hours. So not huge in the Mm. whole scheme of things. Uh, You've got pumped hydro systems that are certainly bigger than that. But it's just a start. It's a start, that's right. In Australia, we're about to have our largest VRFB installed, which is only going to have 4 megawatts of power and 16 megawatt hours of capacity. So again, not that big, but... We're always looking for new ways to store energy. It's going to be the new economy, the new way of doing things. The most disappointing part, of course, is that the patent that the University of New South Wales had back in 1986 obviously is not able to be commercialised now because it's that many years after the patent that people can actually use the information from the patent without having to pay a patent fee to the UNSW. Mm. So back in the 80s, would have been the time for this to be commercialised and taken advantage of. But again, back in the 80s, we were just burning coal. It was going out of fashion. (laughs) Well, it was going out of fashion. But yeah, it's it's certainly a different scenario. But we'll see more of these. Norway recently commissioned a VRFB battery. And so I think we'll see more and more of these things happening and this particular battery. But this is only today. We'll see a lot of new things happening in this whole space. This is just one of those new things happening. Now, Google and Microsoft are going head-to-head for a search engine supremacy. We know that people have been solidly Googling things for about 25 years now. If you prefer to bing your information, then you're clearly in the minority. So, so much so that... You have got to know that some listeners won't even understand what I meant by but that phrase, binging your information. But with the onset of Microsoft's chat GPT, Google's days are numbered unless they come up with something just as clever, and they need to do it fast. Matt, how are things looking at Google Central now that Bing has stepped up the AI game? Well, I love the rivalries we see in business and in particular in tech businesses. And there's some particular great when ones. they're juggernauts. Oh, that's exactly right. We've had those ones that go back to... The mid-70s, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs, obviously with Microsoft and Apple. We've had Intel versus AMD. We've had, even go back further, we've had Edison versus Tesla back in the late 1800s. So we've had some of those great rivalries over the years. But there are times when someone would like to think there's great rivalry, but one is so far ahead that they'd actually know the other one exists. (laughs) And I reckon that's where we are in search engines at the moment. In 2022, Google had... 92.9% of the search engine market share. That's not bad. Bing was in second place. Well done, (laughs) Bing. Good on you. 3.03%. 
was being in and second place. Alta Vista? <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> I don't even you know if that your age. exists. <laughs> Yahoo's in there somewhere as well. They'd probably be in third place, I'd suggest. So if someone... Just by the way, if you're Yahooing your information <laughs> these days, come on. It's not a verb like Google, <laughs> is it? It just doesn't seem right. So for someone like Microsoft or Bing, they would love to have a rivalry with Google, but they're just... They're too small. You can't mm. have a rivalry when, when you've got that big a difference. The way to change that, the way to get a rivalry, is to change the market, is to change got to the change the way people think. That's right. And that's exactly what Chat GPT is about Chat GPT is about to do. When you go into Google, you search and you type in whatever you're searching for, and you get a few options come up, and normally it's from one of those first four or five maybe the first page, you'll find something there that's what you're after, but you've got to click on each one and have a bit of a read and click on the next one and have a bit of a read. Now, I've played around with ChatGPT a bit over the last few weeks while we've been talking about ChatGPT and also to scare you as a teacher. (laughs) And certainly it's different because when you go to ChatGPT and type in something as a search, for example, give me some information on Douglas Adams' SEP field, for example, it doesn't give you a few sites to go and look at. It does all that for you collates the information from the internet Mm. and then gives you a paragraph or two as an answer with all that compilation, with all that assimilation of data into one answer. So I've actually been using ChatGPT as a search engine over the last few days just to test it out. And it's actually quite good. It's quite fascinating because it gives you that quick summary without you having to get into each of those sites and find which one's got the correct information for you. So that's actually working quite well, but that's what Microsoft wants to do. They want you to start using Bing and they're going to incorporate chat GPT into Bing. So when you type in a search term, you don't get a bunch of sites. That's so yesterday. That's Mm. so Google. You just get the answer with all that information. Now, Google, believe it or not, is worried about this. 92.9% market share. And they're worried about this. Mm. So they're releasing Google Bard and they're releasing it probably before it's ready to be released. Google Bard, oh. <laughs> of course, is the... It sounds like a recipe for disaster. <laughs> Here we go, another one like Google Bard, hopeless. <laughs> well, that. and that's the potential because that's their AI tool. That's their equivalent with peril, yeah. of, of ChatGPT, but it's not ready yet. They didn't think that ChatGPT was ready to go mainstream. They just thought, oh, yeah, people play with that. That's fine. They've been working feverishly on Bard. I don't know if they've gone into ChatGPT and said, how can we make Bard better? Maybe that'd be a, <laughs> a good option for them. But they've been working away so they're about to launch Google with Bard built in, so you'll be able to go and do the same thing as ChatGPT. Now, the great thing about all these rivalries, those rivalries I mentioned before and any other rivalry you can think of, whether it be Energizer versus Duracell or PlayStation we talked about before versus Xbox, the consumer, we are the ultimate winners. So whether it ends up being Microsoft Bing with ChatGPT built in or Google Bard or Google with Bard built in, whatever the winner is, I know that our searching process is going to be made easier by all of this. Yeah. And I'm, I'm just fascinated. I think the answers we're getting out of ChatGPT already are unbelievable. And we keep being reminded Microsoft only invested US $10 because they didn't want to throw too much money at it. And it's only in its experimental stages at this stage. So where are we headed with all this? It's yeah. actually quite fascinating. Well, they're going to have to work quickly, I reckon, uh, and because uh, ChatGPT just could take over everything. Yeah, that's right. Oh. So that's how that's how you knock someone down that's got a 92.9% market share. <laughs> you change the game. Change the game. Yeah, if you're beating me at game A, let's go and play game B. And just like that, we are done for another week here at Tech Talk with Matthew Dickerson and our 100th episode. Yay! <laughs> we hope you've picked up something, maybe a couple of things that might make you sound a bit cleverer in the lunchroom this week. Well and that done, was, Matt. just for reference, that was the real James doing that yay. That wasn't the <laughs> AI version of James. <laughs> Stay tuned for the AI version. Uh, well done, Matt. Thanks for another cracking tech talk. I'm off to Google my number plate and see how many crimes I've already been linked to. Or perhaps I'll just jump ship and bing it instead. Check out what chat GPT can come up with. As always, we are extremely grateful to you for checking in with us each week. Let's face it, we'd be here anyway, but your part in the picture always makes it a thousand times better. So thanks to you as well. I'm James Eddy, wishing you a fabulous week, and we look forward to catching you for Tech Talk in another week's time.